So uh, we are to, this is uh, Commissioner Barbara Baker chairing this meeting in the absence of our real chair, which is Chair Carpenter. We are on now to something that we all look forward to every year, which is our annual Wolf Report. This is only a briefing and only a briefing on the numbers of wolves that we have in our um, state, I guess, as of today. So without further ado, uh, we have Ben Maletsky and Dan, Dan Brinson um, briefing us today. Take it away, I suppose, Ben. Yeah, thank you, Commissioner Baker. And thank you, Commissioners and Director Suswin. Um, appreciate being here to, to share the status of wolves. And each year we compile all the information kind of of everything wolf uh, related uh, from the calendar year, January 1st. 2020 through December 31st, uh, 2020. And so this is an update of, of how the wolf, um, oh, wolf numbers, um, wolf conflict, uh, money allocations, all the different things that affect wolf recovery in Washington. And so we're gonna be covering, covering that um, with this briefing and sharing that information for 2020. And so uh, we'll start out with the listing status. In 2020, in the eastern part of Washington, wolves were uh, listed as state endangered. Um, and then in the western two thirds of the state, uh, they were listed under the Federal um, Endangered Species Act. And so they had federal listing and under federal status. Um, that has subsequently changed in January of 2021. Wolves were delisted federally, um, but they still remain under the statewide endangered species status uh, where WDFW has jurisdiction. And so for that, um, all statewide where, where WDFW has a jurisdiction, they're covered under the Wolf Conservation Management Plan guidelines. And that was adopted in 2011. It established three recovery regions. Um, and then it also established uh, the delisting requirements or the guidelines for that um, based out of the plan. And so, but wolves are also managed on uh, tribal lands and under tribal managed as well, where WDFW doesn't have jurisdiction. So uh, where, wherever you are in the state, um, you know, it, it's covered under, under that conservation plan or under that um, tribal management. Um, and so the wolf plan does uh, set up guidelines for recovery objectives. Um, it has definitions for packs and a pack is two or more wolves traveling together in the winter. And then kind of the metric that the plan distinguishes um, for recovery objectives is a successful breeding pair. And that's an adult male and adult female wolf traveling with at least two pups that survived to December 31st in a given year. And so that's why our survey efforts are, are in the winter time is so we can try and get a grasp of how many of those pups survive through the winter and the adults as well. And so the recovery objectives that the plan sets up as guidelines, there's 15, uh, in order to do list wolves, we, uh, the plan suggests having 15 successful breeding pairs for three consecutive years. And it'll be four and it, spreads out those uh, successful breeding pairs into the recovery region. So uh, it would like to specify four successful breeding pairs in the Eastern recovery region, four in the North Cascades recovery region, and four okay. successful breeding pairs in the South Cascades and Northwest Coast recovery region. And then uh, three successful breeding pairs could be located anywhere in the state to reach that 15. And then that's for three consecutive years. Uh, there's also a provision that we could reach our, the recovery goals in in the plan with 18 successful breeding pairs for just one year. And that would be four successful breeding pairs in each of the recovery regions and then six anywhere in the state. And so kind of as we go through this, you can look and see where we're at um, in relation to those recovery goals. Um, so in order to, to figure out how many successful breeding pairs, one of the tools we use um, is capturing and monitoring wolves. And so in the 2020 calendar year, we were able to capture 12 wolves uh, from eight different packs. Um, because we had some wolves collared coming into 2020, we were actually able to monitor 21 wolves from 14 different packs at some point in the year. Uh, but wolves disperse and some wolves die. 
and some collars malfunction. The technology is not always perfect. Um, we're currently monitoring 16 wolves from 10 different packs. And so um, those collars can help us out um, finding wolves in the wintertime with packs with collars. When we do these annual surveys, which typically start January 1st and run through uh, into March sometimes to, to make it as, as wolves uh, start to recolonize the state and more and more, um, it's a big state. So we use collars and, and aerial surveys with fixed wing planes. And then we also use um, helicopters when we do captures to actually physically count the number of wolves when we fly over. And packs that we don't have collared wolves, uh, we can go out with snowmobiles and snowshoes and skis and, and track those packs and can count the number of tracks and number of individuals from there. If it's an area with high use of the wolf pack, we can set cameras out in those areas as well and, and get counts. And so um, each year I put a slide in and I try and talk about those survey efforts and, and how we capture wolves, but we were able to put some resources in and work with a videographer um, to create a video to, to show folks how we do those counts and how we capture wolves. And so I'd like to take a few minutes just to show a quick video and, and help folks understand more of what we do uh, by vis visually showing them in a video here. Tomac Airport. Tomac Do you hear audio on there? Yes. Guys all set? Yep, I'm good, two buckles. Coming up, there we go. A lot of the flying we're doing is not, it's not anything most people would even, would even conceive of happening. There she is, right here. There. Point, right here. I, I, I don't see her. Okay, six o'clock. Six o'clock? Right there. Okay, got her. We're flying. 10 feet off the ground at 30 miles an hour around trees just to get a chance oh. at maybe darting a single animal. Maybe. Right there. Ah, dart him. Dart him. Nice job. Good. Nice job. Virtually had no wolves left in Washington State after 1930, and in the 90s and early 2000s, wolves started to show up in reports occasionally. But in 2008, we were able to confirm our first pack, and then from there, it's been building. So they're coming from British Columbia, they're coming from Idaho, Montana, and part of my job in monitoring the population is seeing where. They're recolonizing what parts of Washington they're showing up and trying to find them as they get here. We're monitoring wolves a lot of different ways in all these different, different aspects to answer the same question, how many wolves are there and how's recovery progressing? It might seem simple, but there's a lot going on in that. <laughs> Today, we went out on snowmobiles in the Loop Loop Pack territory. We are doing our winter surveys where we try to get a minimum count of the number of wolves in each pack. And so we were looking for tracks and sign of wolves, because that's one of our methods for counting them. So we got two at least going this way. And if you've got a lot of sign and activity, we'll throw up a trail camera there and see when they come back through. And so we do that first. And if we think wolves are in the area and we think it's a pack of wolves and they may have pups, we'll then try to go in and we'll try to collar one of those adult wolves. And the way we do that is by trapping them in the summer. So we'll go in, we'll set these leg hold traps just like you could probably imagine, except for they have rubber instead of steel where the teeth are. 
and you go out and you check traps and you don't catch anything. You go out and you check more traps and you don't catch anything. They can be incredibly frustrating because wolves are incredibly smart. And the winter is, it's a whole different thing. In the winter time with a pack, with a collar, we can go in and, and put another collar in or switch those collars out with a helicopter. We'll draw the blood. I will put your tags in, put a microchip in it just like you would microchip a dog. This was a and then we'll collect a tissue sample for DNA and uh, we'll take all kinds of measurements and we'll fasten that collar on. By having a collar in the pack in the winter time, we're able to go out and use a fixed wing plane and we can circle with the plane, locate where that pack is and we can actually physically count the number of wolves. One, two, there's at least two straight down. A large part of our wolf monitoring has been collar based. So as wolf biologists, we go out and we put radio collars on wolves and then that information allows us to figure out how many wolves are in packs and kind of what a territory looks like. But as the wolf population grows, we're not able to maintain collars in every pack. I'm sure this is a GPS collar, right? Yeah. Every time we put a collar on, you're stressing that animal. You're running a risk of injuring or killing that animal. You're running a risk of injuring or killing yourself if you're flying in a helicopter. More and more, the more I do it, the more I realize how dangerous it is. And, I, and kind of what we're risking to do this. And then when you really think about what we're getting kind of in return, what kind of data we're getting, that's kind of when we start thinking about, are there other ways to get this data? Do we need to risk as much to do this? Collars are a tool, but we're looking at cheaper ways and better ways to constantly refine how we're finding wolves on the landscape. Audiomaz are a open source, computer chip based listening device. And setting the audio moth is simply just putting this little device in a Ziploc bag and stapling it to a tree. We're just listening to the sounds that are out there and we're using that to tell us how many wolves are in a landscape. That's never been done before and it's super exciting. You're listening to wolves howl. I think we gather a lot of this information because people want to know. For the folks that love to see wolves on the landscape, they want to know. For the folks that have livestock and may not love wolves and may not want to have them on the landscape, they still want to know. These animals are very normal in a lot of ways. So when I say normal, I'm not meaning like they're boring or anything like that, but that no, they have no idea that they're controversial and they're just doing regular wolf stuff every day. I like to say they're just another critter on the landscape and they're not near the, the big bad wolf that everybody makes them out, but they're not a saint either, you know. They're right in the middle. <laughs> and I just wish folks would understand that a little bit more. So. Well, so that was uh, a video put together uh, by the team of Wolf Bios, Trent and Gabe, uh, and I work statewide, but we also work with um, all the, our tribal partners and, you know, it couldn't be done without, uh, you know, all the, all the reports from the public 
and all the bios and enforcement staff and conflict specialists, uh, folks in other agencies to help us gather this information. Uh, as, as wolves recolonize and continue to recolonize, I'm constantly reminded how big Washington is. And so without the support of, of all these folks, um, it's tough to keep up as new PACs establish. And so, um, but now I'll move in uh, to, the, uh, to the updates and the briefing where we're at on wolf recovery. And this is a, the new map that we have uh, for 2020. And you can see this past year, we ended up with four new packs. We ended up with a new pack just south of Lookout um, in Chelan County and um, or Okanagan, Southern Okanagan County, I'm sorry, uh, which is the Navarre pack. And then the Vulcan pack is up by Vulcan Mountain up in Ferry County. Uh, the Onion Creek pack established just west of Smackout. And then the Skookum pack um, established uh, just south of Goodman Meadows, actually some Collared wolves from Goodman Mendoza pack moved south to recreate a pack that we had in the past um, called Skookum. And so we also had a couple packs. Um, well, the Absa Creek and Kettle's pack, we we're still, we went out and did surveys, but we we're only able to determine one individual that was occupying a territory. Each time we went in to do surveys, we only had the one individual in each of those packs. And so they didn't meet the definition of a pack. Uh, for 2020, but because there was still a wolf that was maintaining a territory in those areas, we still kept them on the on the map. They just aren't official packs for 2020. And so, if we look at those numbers uh, across the state and how how we're looking um, in the eastern uh, recovery region, we had nine successful breeding pairs in areas managed by WDFW under WDFW jurisdiction with a minimum count of 98 and a number of packs was 18. And then the Confederated Tribes of the Caldwell Reservation uh, determined they had reached their recovery goals uh, two years ago, or I guess last year in the report last year, we separated out those numbers uh, just because they don't conduct the, the similar surveys in the wintertime, they still get numbers, but uh, they're, um, they don't typically use do the, the winter survey uh, like we we have historically done in the past. And so we just put those numbers separately now um, so that you can see the differences. Um, in the North Cascades recovery region, we had four successful breeding pairs. This is the first time that we've met that minimum uh, criteria for the uh, recovery plan of four successful breeding pairs in that recovery region. We had a minimum count of 34 wolves in that recovery region with six packs. And we have not been able to determine or uh, document a, a pack in the South Cascades. We're still looking, um, but still those numbers are, are zero for this year. But a total of successful breeding pairs of 16, a minimum count of 178 wolves and 29 packs. And so just to look at some of the distribution of the successful breeding pairs in 2020, um, in the Eastern Recovery Region, uh, we have a good, um, smattering of, of successful breeding pairs uh, down the Blue Mountains, the Tushi Pack. I will note that the Butte Creek Pack, we did document pups in there last year and uh, we had four adults last spring, but with the winter conditions and um, we weren't able to pick them up with a flight this past winter. So we don't have a good count from this past winter. We're pretty confident that that pack is still there and doing well, but it's an unknown for this year. And so, uh, but we still had the, the same four packs in the Blue Mountains. Um, in the North Cascade recovery region, uh, there's the, the four successful breeding pairs that we had there in the Tianway, Lookout, Sullivan Creek, and the Loop Loop Pack territories. Um, the Navarre and Nainam Creek packs uh, were not determined to be successful breeding pairs this past year, but we continue monitoring those packs as well. And then if we look at those the numbers and trends over time, uh, the wolf population continues to, to grow in Washington for the 12th consecutive year. And uh, I have this split out by the uh, Colville, um, Confederated Tribes of the Colville Reservation and WDFW jurisdictions. Um, but you can see in both metrics that the, the population is still uh, trending upward in those areas. If we look at successful breeding pairs, um, you can note that the 
in the Eastern recovery region, we've kind of plateaued out a bit um, on successful breeding pairs, but we are seeing in the North Cascades recovery region that those successful breeding pairs are, are starting to, to go upward with four this year. Um, you'll see in 2019, um, we didn't have numbers of successful breeding pairs. As I mentioned, uh, the Confederated Tribes of the Colville Reservation was not doing uh, the winter surveys that year. So we just didn't have um, the number of pups that made it through to the, the end of the year for them last year. This year, they gave us uh, some numbers there um, that they had um, gotten uh, from the previous year, um, but just done in a different methodology. And so if we look every year, we still always try and monitor the number of mortalities um, that occurred that we know about. And this past year, we had 16 mortalities in Washington and eight of those were legal tribal harvest. Uh, one of those was a vehicle collision. We had two wolves die natural causes. One was shot uh, due to a perceived threat to human safety. And then uh, three were removed due to depredations. That was the wedge pack up in Stevens County. And then we had one die of unknown causes. And then we also document where we have collars on wolves. Um, we document dispersals, which uh, this past year, uh, we had, I think, eight dispersals here, or seven, seven dispersals, or eight dispersals it is. Um, but most notably on this slide, um, you know, it just reminds me every year when we get these long distance dispersers like uh, 93M out of Lookout Pack, you know, he traveled a long ways up into British Columbia. But if you turn that line any which direction, it could get to anywhere in Washington state. The ability for wolves to disperse is, is pretty remarkable. Um, and so when I get reports from the public of, of wolves being in the South Cascades or, or anywhere, you know, I take them all very seriously just because of the ability of, of wolves to disperse. And you can, can see that clearly just by looking at some of these dispersal paths that we see. Um, and then in, in kind of summary of the population, looking at the long-term trend from 2008 to 2020, uh, we still see that uh, continued growth in the population um, down the bottom. On, Around 2020, we had 178 wolves, up from 145 last year, uh, 26 uh, packs, up to 29 packs. And then last year, we didn't have the uh, Confederated Tribes of the Culver Reservation successful breeding pairs. So that number is a little bit low from last year in 2019, but we're up to 16 this year. And then our annual growth rate overall, we grew 24% this past year, the wolf population. And um, from 2008 to present, it's a 26% growth rate uh, for the wolf population in Washington. So we're still on a good upward trend. We had 16 uh, mortalities. And then uh, we always document the number of packs involved in depredations with livestock. And this past year, we had 24% of the packs were involved with depredation. But that also means 76% of our packs um, have not had depredations with livestock. And so the, the overwhelming majority of them, even though many of them do overlap livestock, uh, we don't see depredations. And so that's still promising and overall 14%. But I'm gonna let Dan Brinson is gonna talk to, talk to you more about um, wolf livestock interactions and numbers associated with that um, this, um, this past year. So Dan. Are you there, Dan? Myself. <laughs> there we go. Yes, I'm here. Get myself unmuted there. Uh, thanks, Ben. Yes, my name is Dan Brinson. I'm the uh, statewide manager for a wildlife conflict section. So in the next several slides, I'm going to provide uh, a summary of some of the highlights from 2020 as it relates to wolf livestock interactions. Next slide. The wolf livestock interaction protocol serves as a guiding document to wolf management activities in Washington state. For instance, the guidelines that take into account depredation events and non-lethal deterrent tools when considering lethal removal is a component of that protocol. In 2020, the department adopted a formal definition of range riding, including a detailed list of duties and expectations of range riders, whether they be contracted through WDFW, 
employed by an individual producer or working for one of the uh, non-government organizations. This definition of protocol ensures consistency by identifying what activity qualifies as range rec. Next slide. Next slide, there we go. Um, so this chart shows the number of packs each year and the number of packs involved in a depredation event during the same year. It's been mentioned previously, seven or 24% or of the 29 known packs that existed in Washington at some point during 2020 were involved in at least one confirmed livestock mortality and, or injury. And then uh, talked about you know, what that means is uh, 76% uh, are not involved in any known depredations. Next slide. Uh, this slide represents confirmed livestock mortalities by year. Here you can see the number of livestock killed each year by wolves, the darker color cattle and the lighter color uh, sheep. WDFW investigators confirmed nine cattle as being killed by wolves during the year. In addition to confirmed mortalities, another 30 cattle and one herding dog were confirmed as being injured by wolves. Also, three calf mortalities and two calf injuries were also determined as probable depredations by wolves after investigation. Next slide. In terms of what time of year mortalities are occurring, you can see that consistent with what have uh, been observed in past years, wolf caused livestock loss in 2020 was most prevalent during the spring, summer grazing season when livestock are turned out on the range to feed on large grazing allotments where the landscape is shared with wildlife, including large predators. Next slide. This slide takes a look at uh, the WDFW expenditures for managing wolves in Washington state. Now this doesn't include the Department of Agriculture grants for non-lethal deterrence and funding appropriated to Stevenson Ferry counties for a wildlife specialist employed by the Sheriff's Department. During the calendar year of 2020, WDFW spent a total of a little more than 1.5 million on wolf management activities including $110,000 in cost share reimbursements to 33 livestock producers participating in damage prevention cooperative agreements. The reimbursements were for non-lethal conflict prevention expenses like range riding, specialized lighting, fencing, et cetera. A little more than $150,000 uh, for contracted range riders, $17,000 to five producers for livestock losses caused by wolves, a little more than $77,000 for lethal removal operations in response to depredation on livestock, and the rest, um, a little less than uh, $1.2 million for all the wolf management and research activities. It's important to note that Several activities are grouped in this broad category of wolf management. Included in these activities are the wildlife conflict specialist's time spent with producers, conducting investigations, and managing a host of preventative non-lethal projects. Other activities funded here include biologists, managers' time, equipment, and a number of important research projects, which Ben will talk about next. And with that, I'll turn it back over to you, Ben. Thank you. Thanks, Dan. Yeah, and so those some of those projects that are involved each year when I do the annual report, I try and reach out to all the different um, universities and graduate students and professors uh, that we cooperate with and, and work with that are doing research on um, that has some facet um, associated with wolves. And so if you want to find out more about any of these projects, um, there's abstracts in the annual report under the ongoing research that you can read up a little bit about more of them, and find out more about the, the principal investigators there if you want to find out more about those projects. And so, but there's a whole horse, host of folks working on research projects around the state, um, 
related to wolves and predator prey dynamics and population modeling of wolves um, and crossing structures, uh, or not crossing structures, but uh, habitat connectivity and things like that. And so check out some of those abstracts and, um, and check out some of the cool work going on around the, the state. And then we also uh, try and do outreach as much as possible. Um, this past year was tough with COVID. Uh, I think everybody was faced with challenges, uh, but we were able to put together a, a couple or a few videos uh, to help explain some of the, the wolf recovery and wolf management in Washington and some of the research projects going on. And uh, we've also got a couple with these new numbers, a couple more presentations slated to share via Zoom and, and uh, methods to, to share information on wolf recovery and where that's going. And so uh, stay tuned to some of those, but you can check out our, our wolf reports and publications and videos on our website to check out some of those videos and uh, see, see what else we have in store.